And we're going to continue today talking about God. And again, people say, well, we talk about God all the time in church. And we do. But do we focus on God? Now understand, you hear about God a lot outside of the church as well. More often than not, however, His name is not used correctly. So today we're going to talk about the name of God and why that's important. Because oftentimes people say, what's in a name? You know, it's amazing how we say that, but if we're expecting a child or, or we're doing something, we always are really concerned about the name, picking out the name. And so we're going to talk about how important the name of God is. And like I said, often we hear the name of God outside the church. Unfortunately, it's used wrongly. It's used in vain. You've heard of people, OMG. You see that? OMG! Or they go around saying, oh my God. Now it's one thing if you're dangling from a precipice and you're fighting the thing and you're going to fall into the mouth of some creature... That might be considered a prayer. But more often than not, God's name is used in vain. Oh my God this. Oh my God that. I was watching TV the other night and they had a commercial come on where the song underneath the commercial had that repeated over and over and over and over and over again. Oh my God. And so now it's become so prevalent that we've shortened it to OMG because we think that's even better. That's okay. But it's really not. As a matter of fact, when I say this, there are probably some people saying, oh, you're making too big a deal out of this. You're making too big a thing. Oh, it's just part of the culture. Well, there are a lot of things that are part of the culture we ought to make bigger deals out of. But when we're talking about the name of God, listen to me very carefully, you can't make too big a deal out of this. And we need to stop and, and ask ourselves, are we guilty of taking the Lord's name in vain? Or we oftentimes take His Son, Jesus Christ. I've heard that taken in vain as well. Sometimes you hear the name Jesus mentioned more when somebody hits their thumb with a hammer than when somebody is trying to tell them about Christ. And you say, oh, that world is terrible. Listen, it goes on in the church. Walking through the hallways, I hear it. Interacting with people, I hear it. And you're saying, but pastor, it's not that big a deal. Let's talk about it. It is a big deal. Because understand this. He says, God said in his Exodus, we're going to be in Exodus today. Boy, Aaron was in Exodus last week. And didn't Aaron do a great job last week? Yes. Did a fantastic job. We are blessed. We're going to continue in Exodus. And we're going to look at Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to be back and forth. But one of the Ten Commandments, and I know there are some of you out there saying, Brother Mike, because you're armchair theologians, Brother Mike, we're under grace, we're not under the law anymore. The Old Testament doesn't matter. Listen, the Old Testament was Jesus' Bible. And while we're not part of the Jewish nation, and many of the laws pertaining to the Jewish people, no, they don't specifically pertain to we who are Gentiles. But it's the whole general universal desire for morality that yes, these laws are still for us to a great extent. If not specifically, generally speaking. And one of the commandments, the third commandment says in Exodus chapter 20 verse 7, you shall not take the Lord, the, the name of the Lord your God in vain. The word vain means to be frivolent, to be useless, empty, just to throw it around. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Listen to this. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You say, that's pretty harsh for just a name. Well, let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you and I were out there working on a project and I'm out there hammering and I'm such a great carpenter, okay, you know I'm going to hit my thumb with that hammer. Can you imagine if I went and took a whack at my thumb and I called out your mother's name? How would that make you feel? 
Or if I had a flat tire, I'd call out your dad's name as a curse word and a byword. How would that make you feel? But beyond that, God's name is even more important than just hurt feelings and inappropriate manners. I want you to see something that I found as I was cruising through the internet from DesiringGod.com. It says this. It says, what so many fail to see is that God, uh, God's jealousy for His name. Wait a minute, God's jealous? I thought jealousy was a sin. Well, different aspects of jealousy can be wrong, but listen, jealousy in and of itself, when you love something and you don't want it abused or taken away, that kind of jealousy is okay. And yes, God has a jealous uh, aspect about Him because He loves His children. He loves his, his, his whole aspect. And when it's abused or his children are abused, of course he's going to be jealous. Or when somebody threatens to take them away from him. There's jealousy. What so many fail to see is that God's jealousy for his name, and now notice what it says, his jealousy to be supreme in our affections. He wants us to love him supremely. Just like you in a marriage want your spouse to love you supremely. How would you feel if your spouse said, you know, you're all right, but I really like our neighbor. You're all right, but that coworker at, 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 at the cubicle next to me, wow. I think that would bother you, and rightly so. How about you parents with children? You know, yeah, mom and dad, we love you, but we like playing over the Smiths a whole lot better. Don't tell me you wouldn't be jealous over that. God wants to be supreme in our affection. And He deserves that because He's God. We've already talked about that. It goes on to say, His jealousy to be supreme in our affection is our salvation and joy. Because we will see later on that there is no salvation apart from the name of God. We find our salvation in Him. And we must and should find our true and ultimate joy in Him. We did a whole series on the book of Philippians talking about the spirit of joy. Where does joy come from? Well, it comes from God. And we experience that joy when we're focused on God. And we talk about His name. And, and here are some examples of God's name in Scripture and the import of it and the power of it. It says in, for instance, Psalm 25, 11, it says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. The psalmist recognizes God's forgiving aspect in His name. How about this? Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Psalm 79. He saved them for His name's sake. Psalm 106. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it and is safe. Proverbs 18.10 So therefore we don't treat uh, therefore we don't we don't treat the Lord's name in vain. It is powerful. It is important for salvation, for joy, for safety and peace. And to just throw it out there without care, without concern, and even using it as a byword, a curse word, is the epitome of insult to Almighty God. His name is that important. So that's why we're studying God over the next few weeks. We're getting a right and proper understanding of God, who He is, and His name figures into that. And as I said earlier, we quoted from Thomas Aquinas talking about how erring in one part at the beginning can throw off your trajectory for the rest of your life. Uh, Dr. Norman Geisler said the same thing in a sense, along with Dr. Doug Potter in their book on theology. It said, almost all of one's study of the Bible is an outworking of their understanding of the nature of God. When you study your Bible... Your study is going to be colored and influenced by what you think of God. How you think God is. Who you think God is. What about His characteristics? How does He respond? How does He react? Almost all of one's study of the Bible is an outworking of their understanding of the nature of God. Hence, a mistake here can have drastic consequences in other areas of Bible doctrine. 
Do you know why we have so many denominations and there are so many interpretations of Scripture? It's because people are not surrendered to the power and majesty of God enough for them to accept the way God has written His Word. And so they go off on tangents and they focus on things that scratch their itch, tickle their ears. And therefore you have denominations, you have disagreements, you have disputes. Because we are not settled on our understanding of who God is and what He wants. So this morning we're going to continue in the book of Exodus. And we're going to ask God, actually we're going to be in Genesis, we're going to ask God what exactly is his name and what does he want so let's bow together in prayer heavenly father we are grateful to be here this morning lord we're living in a culture that is quickly divorcing itself from you and from your word and from your values and father the sad part about it is the church is not far behind father we have let down our guard Father, we have grown distracted and indifferent to the things that you've presented us about yourself and your message and your mission. Father, I ask, starting with me, that you would forgive us. And now, Lord, as we open your word to seek your face, I pray that you'll help us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we get into this this morning, we're going to go over to um, Exodus as we look at the burning bush. Remember the story of the burning bush? It's one of the well-known stories in Scripture. Moses, at 80 years old, 80 years old, had already been the prince of Egypt for 40. And then for another 40, he went to the wilderness and wandered around. Now, you know, we talk about that. And here is a man of God, one of the heroes of the faith, And what an extreme situation his life had been. At one minute, he is at the center of power, living an opulent, glorious lifestyle. And the next 40 years, the next minute of his life, out in the wilderness, tending sheep for his father-in-law. You know, today people think that if they don't have an executive job in a well-known business with a corner office, their own house, two cars, and six kids... Why, they just don't think they've made it. Well, look at Moses at 40. Tending sheep. Have you ever been around sheep? Sheep are not pleasant animals to hang around with. Oh, they're not mean. They're stupid. But they're not mean. And they stink to high heaven. And they don't obey the shepherd most of the time. They go off here, they go off there. They get distracted. They get hungry. More often than not, they get themselves in trouble. And Moses, that was his job. Out in the middle of nowhere, tending sheep. And he saw himself as the deliverer of God's people. And the only thing he was delivering was mutton and wool. And it wasn't even his, his flock. It belonged to his father-in-law, Jethro. The guy from Beverly Hillbillies. No, not really. <laughs> it belonged to his father-in-law, so he had no real home. He had no business. And here he was working for his father-in-law, tending sheep. Now, if you knew anything about Hebrew culture, shepherd was rather low on the totem pole. That is not what you aspired to be. That's not what you wanted your children to grow up and be. Boy, I want Junior to grow up and be a shepherd. That, didn't, that never rang from any Hebrew house. And Moses, who had fancied himself as God's man and God's deliverer, probably lost sight of that a long time ago until one day, 40 years had gone by and he was wandering in the desert and suddenly he saw a bush on fire. Now, really, that's not a big deal. I've seen bushes on fire before. When I was uh, at the church at West Concord, when we were on White Street, I remember I would go up White Street to go visit a couple of our folks. 
And I was going up to visit uh, Ms. Miller, and I was walking down the street, and as I was walking, I saw smoke off to the side of the road. And I looked, and someone had tossed a cigarette out of their car, and it caught this woman's hedges on fire. So I was out there being, you know, firefighter with my jacket putting this fire out. And people started coming out of their house, houses wondering why I started that fire. So, you know, but it was no big deal. Put it out. So Moses is walking along and he sees this bush burning. And Moses said, I think I'll go check it out. So he goes over to this bush and then he realizes, wait a minute, this bush is not burning up. It's not being consumed by the flames. The flames are strong. The flames are hot. The flames are bright and they're intense. But the bush is not being burned up. And suddenly as Moses is amazed by this, he hears the voice of God call him. Moses, can you imagine? 40 years, he'd forgotten about it altogether, probably. He probably thought, man, my life is a failure. Moses. When I was on White Street at that burning bush, I didn't hear, Mike. I heard, what are you doing? (laughs) So Moses has an encounter with God. With God. God comes and speaks directly to Moses, verbally, through the burning bush. Moses could hear it. And now God was ready for Moses to be his deliverer. Moses had thought that should have happened 40 years earlier. Can you imagine the emotions that were roiling inside Moses at this time? Amazement, shock. Awe, humility. And do you think he might have been just a little bit upset? What took so long? But maybe that was pushed aside because the God of all glory was speaking to him. Moses. Moses said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord proceeded to outline the next 40 years of his life for him because Moses lived to be 120. And it was at 80 years old that Moses got the command to go into ministry, 80 years old. So when, you know, as we're getting Sunday school started, as we're getting things, climb, as we're climbing up out of the COVID hole and we're asking people to jump in and volunteer, please don't you dare tell me, I'm too old, Brother Mike, because I will bring this passage up to you. So God is outlining Moses' ministry and he wants Moses to go and deliver his people from the Egyptians who had enslaved them. And they had been enslaved for over four centuries. There was about 450 years between Abraham and Moses. And the children of Israel had called out and called out over the centuries and God finally answered in his timetable. Moses, you're the man, go. So here's this man from the wilderness. He smelled of sheep. He was dirty. He was filthy. He was was old. And can you imagine, now, Lord, me? I'm supposed to go to three million people and say, hey, I'm here. I'm the deliverer. How is that going to work, Lord? And one of the questions Moses asked was this. And this is the ultimate question. Look what he says. He said, verse 13 is where we are. It says, Then Moses said to God, after God had kind of outlined everything, it says, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What will I say to them? What will I say to them, Lord? So here we have the ultimate question, who is God? Who is God? And people are asking that now all the time still. Matter of fact, ever since the Garden of Eden, it has never been off the table. People have been asking, who is God? Who is God? And people have been answering. Some people say, oh, there's not just one, there are a bunch of them. Or they, there are two of them. Or this God is a fish, or this God is a cow, or this God is, and they they create images and idols. Well, the whole idea of there being multiple gods is impossible anyway. There can't even be two gods. Because by very nature, God is not uh, limited to space and time and matter. 
We talked about that a few weeks ago. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. He's not limited. How can you have two gods and both of them be unlimited for they would limit each other? How can you have multiple gods? Because then they'd really limit each other and they would not be gods. They would not be deities. You can only have one God. So we have one God. How do we know there's one God? Well, look around you. You see all this stuff? Grass, trees, sky, birds, squirrels, you. We know there's a God because we exist. We had to come from somewhere. Humanity has not been around forever. The earth is not immortal. The earth had a beginning. Matter had beginning. Time began. Space was created by someone who was outside of space, time, and matter. The Bible says what in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning, God created. God is the ultimate answer. God is the ultimate creator. Who are you, Moses wanted to know. And that's a valid question. God, who are you? And what do we call you? That's the question he asked. What is his name? And people are asking that today. Who are you? Who is he? Who is God? What does he want? What is he like? That's what we're trying to answer here on Sunday morning. But God had an answer for him. God had an answer for him. I want you to notice that's the ultimate question. God, who are you and what is your name? Now, some people say, well, the name of God is, is uh, Allah. People say, Allah. Matter of fact, Pastor, I had somebody tell me once, we worship the same God as Muslims. We worship the same God as Jews. We worship the same God as, as, as Buddhists. The joke is on them, Buddhists don't worship a God. Buddhists say everything is God, including that chair you're sitting in and the carpet I'm standing on. Buddhists are basically what are called pantheists. They think everything is God and therefore they're atheists. They don't believe in a personal God. Well, what about Jews, Christians, and Muslims? Don't we all worship the same God? No. The reason why is when you understand who God is and what He is from their vantage points and compare it with the vantage point of Scripture's God, you have total divergence it's not, well, we're all going toward the same God. It's not like that at all. Allah, for instance, is not a God who is three in one, one in three. Allah is not a loving God. Allah is not interested in you being his child. As a matter of fact, it says in the Quran, to say that you are God's child is the ultimate sin in, Mus in Muslim belief, in Islam. As a matter of fact, the Arabic word for that is shirk. Anyone that claims to be a partner of Allah, anyone that claims to be a son or daughter of Allah is guilty of the ultimate sin that will condemn them to hell. Allah doesn't want to be your father. Allah never wanted to be anybody's heavenly father. And so those kinds of differences, Allah, Muslims do not believe in three and one, one and three. Allah is just one guy, one God. Jesus isn't his son. Oh, they believe Jesus was a great prophet. But Muslims don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, the, 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 the second member of the triunity of God. And with Jews, now in the Old Testament, Jews had an understanding of God. That's our roots. Christianity comes out of Judaism. But Judaism at one point turned its back upon the biblical understanding of God. And in between the Testaments, they developed laws and traditions and so forth wherein they reimagined God to a great extent. Now, please don't get me wrong. The Jews are still God's chosen people. But just like a wayward child, so are the Jews. We need to love them. We need to pray for them. That's why some weeks ago we talked about pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for Israel. They are God's people. Unless we think we're better than anybody else, there are many people who call themselves Christians who have got a distorted, unbiblical viewpoint of who God is, which is what we're trying to correct. So to say that, well, pastor, all the religions in the world lead to God. He just goes by a different name is, is erroneous. Because the beliefs about God and their religious 
system are so contradictory to the beliefs of other gods and other religious systems. It can't be the same person or the same being. There is only one God. There is only one God. So what is His name? That is the ultimate question. Who are you and what do we call you? Well, Moses is going to get his answer. Look at verse 14. Well, Lord, what do we say who your name is? What do I tell them? Well, verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. What? What? Wait, 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 Lord, you said what? I ask you, what name do I take? And you say, I am who I am? You know, that doesn't sound right. I was leaking at something like Bill or John or something like that. What kind of name is I am who I am? Well, it, it sort of loses something in the English. In the Hebrew, there are actually two words used in this passage. And both these words refer, they're sort of the same root word in the Hebrew. But first, the word when he says, I am that I am, is in the Hebrew, aha. That's kind of funny. Or ahaya. There's aha in other places. It's like I found something, aha, okay. It sounds somewhat like that as it's pronounced in Hebrew. Chaya, aha, it's all from the same joint word or root word, Yahweh. And here he's saying, I am the self-existent one. I am who I am. Speaking of the fact that God is existence itself. As I said earlier, God is not bound by space, matter, and time. God has always existed. He has never not existed. In the Yaha or Yah. Uh, Haya, it's a little difficult to keep these straight, and Yahweh, they all speak of the fact that God is self-existent because He is existence Himself. Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas spoke of contingent beings and necessary beings. You and I are contingent beings. What does that mean? It means that we are exist contingent upon someone else's existence. You were born. You had parents. You're here because your parents gave birth to you. Your parents exist because their parents gave birth to them. You rely upon the things of nature to keep you alive. Water, food, oxygen, shelter. We are contingent beings. In other words, we depend upon somebody to bring us into existence and to care for us. God, however, is existence itself. He is a necessary being. He is, as a matter of fact, the only necessary being. Without God, there would be nothing else. Without God, there would be parents, no parents to have children. Without God, there would be no food to eat, water to drink, air to breathe. He is the necessary being, and there's only one, and it's God. You can't have two necessary beings because they would cancel each other out. So God is self-existence. He is existence itself. That phrase, haya in Hebrew literally means I am. Not I was or I will be, I am. God is eternal, self-existent, and He is the essence of existence. Oftentimes people will say, well, what did God do before He created people? What did God do before He created the world? God did. God existed. I'm a human, you're a human. I can't comprehend much of that. I live in time. God exists outside of time. That's how we can say that God has already lived his, your life with you from birth until death. Think of it as standing on a building and watching a parade. When I was growing up in Tampa, we had what was called the Gasparilla Parade every year. They still have it. Because sometime in the 18th century, some pirate, Jose Gaspar, invaded Tampa and took it over and raped and pillaged, and for some reason they celebrate that now. Go figure. But every year in Tampa, they'd have the Gasparilla Parade. When I was little, I would stand on the street and watch the parade, but I really wouldn't see much of other than people's knees and legs because I was tiny and the parade was out there. But you know, you can go to one of the taller buildings in Tampa and you can stand on the roof there and you can see the entire parade from beginning to ending. And that's kind of how I can understand eternity. I can't comprehend it, but I can apprehend it. 
as I look at that. And that's how God sees our lives. That's how God sees things. That's why when we say you can cast your care upon Him for He cares for you, because God has already gone through it with you. God knows already what's going to happen. God has already lived it with you. Yes, there is a balance between free will and God predestinating things. We're not going to solve that theological puzzle this morning. But God is existence itself. Not only that, but He said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Yahweh. Again, Hayah and Yahweh and Aha, all similar Hebrew words with different nuances. And this speaks of the fact that God is the eternal one. I am, not I was or I will be. He will never cease to exist because He never began to exist. He is existence itself. That's why we can trust Him. That's why we can know that God can see everything at once. That God can be everywhere at once. That God could have Mike Brooks in His heart and mind and Shirley Horton in His heart and mind at the same time. He can watch what's going on with the Varney family as well as He can with the Plummer family. He can hear the prayers of all of us. He can hear the prayers of Sue and He can also hear the prayers of Richard and He can be involved in all of these things at one time because He's God. And that's why his name, now the English word we use for Hayah, Aha, and Yahweh is the word Jehovah. You say, why do we use Jehovah? Is that in the Bible? No, not really. What they did when they translated Scripture years ago is because Hebrew has no consonants. Hebrew is all vowels. There are no consonants. So in order to make, instead of Yahweh, they decided to inject consonants, a J. There's no J in the Hebrew language. And they decided to combine the words Jehovah or Yahweh and Adonai, which is Lord, together, and it came out Jehovah. How? I don't know. I've read the stuff. I look at it and they, okay. But that's God's name, Yahweh, Jehovah. He is the all-existent one. He is existence itself, and He is eternal. That is the ultimate answer. Moses, that's who I am. You go to the children of Israel and you tell them, Yahweh, Jehovah, has sent me, and has sent you rather. You go them and tell them my name. It is a powerful name. No, he is not Allah. He is not Buddha. He is not Mishnah. He is not Vashti. He is Yahweh, Jehovah God. The ultimate answer. And because of that, he is the ultimate authority. He is the ultimate authority. Look what he says as we continue in verse 15. He says, moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord. Now you'll notice the word Lord there is in all capitals. That is the way the English translators have clued you onto the fact that the word Yahweh is being used there. Whenever in the Old Testament you read in your Bible, you see the words Lord or God in all capitals. That's indicating to you by the translators that they're using the word Yahweh. As a matter of fact, that word to the Jews is so holy that when they translate Hebrew copies of the Old Testament, they will put four dots there instead of write the name Yahweh because it's that holy to them. So when you see the word Lord in all capitals or God in all capitals, that is Yahweh. By the way, when you see it says there, the Lord God, G-O-D, large G, little O, little D, that's the Hebrew, Hebrew word Elohim. El is, is the generic word for God. That's, ah, by the way, that is where Allah comes from, from that part, but that doesn't mean they're the same God. But the word El means strong one. Elohim, the I am ending in Hebrew, denotes three or more. It's God's a triune being. And when you see the word God used like that, the translators are telling you, it says, if you translate it in English, it would be the Yahweh strong one of your fathers. When you see the word Lord, large L, little O, little D, O, R, D, that's the word Adonai, which means Lord or Master. So just some translating Bible things that you need to understand as you're going. Because the name is important. He says, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial to all generations. So not only is God giving him his name, but he's also giving him his authority. I am God, Yahweh, Lord, eternal and self-existent. I am also Lord and Master, the strong one. 
In other words, Moses, I am your God. I am your God. I have authority over your life. And the same God that appeared to Moses is the same God that we gather and worship today. Just as this God had authority over Moses' life, so this God must and should have authority over our lives as well. And so here's the question. Does this God, Yahweh, have authority over your life this morning? Does this God have control of who you are? Are you willing, like Moses, to go and have that burning bush moment? I'm not talking about a physical copy of it, but I'm talking about where you realize that you are so close to God that yes, even the ground that you occupy is holy, set apart. Do you know God in that way? Do you know God in that sense? Have you sat down and just comprehended and sought out the vastness and amazement that is God? Yahweh, the eternal self-existent one. Elohim, the, the strong one. Adonai, the Lord and Master. Is He your God? Or is your God the bandy-legged old man who sits up in heaven and jumps every time you snap? Or is God your therapist that you go see Him when you're struggling with life, but ignore Him the rest of the time? Or is God your checking account that you can call upon Him when you need something, but you forget Him otherwise? Or is God who He is, the authority in your life? Not only the authority in your life, but He's not a God, He is the God. So therefore, He has the authority over all life. And we live in a culture today that is spitting in the eye of that authority. We see a culture that is running away from God. And so we're telling God, no, you don't know what you're talking about when you give standards and guidelines for your creation. This month is Pride Month. And let me say this about Pride Month, and I'm not here to disparage anybody, but listen, pride over anything is sinful. Falsely praised, self-absorbed, look at me how great I am, pride. You can be proud American, proud this, proud that. It is pride that got humanity in the problem we're in now. But listen, the Bible created Adam and Eve, man and woman. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew in that passage in Genesis basically uses biological terms for a man and a woman. God did not make gender optional. God does not make gender your choice after your birth. People are men or they're women. And the Bible speaks of human sexuality as that, binary. This is how God created us, yet we don't care how God did things and what He wants. That's just one example of how we've pushed God aside. We quit teaching our children about God. Not just in our schools. Oh, we get so mad at the public schools. Why aren't they teaching God in the public schools? Here's something. Why aren't you teaching God in your home? Don't blame the public schools. Oh, Brother Mike, they're taking the Ten Commandments down at the courthouse. We need to pick it. Let me ask you something. Can you quote the Ten Commandments? No. You've already taken them down in your heart and mind. Why don't we pick at you? I love you. This is the God that we need to understand. This is who we're dealing with. He has authority over your life, over my life, and He has the authority over all life. You say, Pastor Farley, are you pro-life? You better bless God and believe it I am. Because God is the author of life. And God should be the only one who takes it away. He is the ultimate authority. Yahweh. Because He is existence itself. He is eternal. He is the creator, the fashioner, the maker, the originator. Romans 11, chapter 11, verse 36 says, For of Him and from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yea, all that dwell therein. 
and yet we treat him with such disdain. It's got to stop. So the ultimate question is, who are you? What is your name? I am God. I am that I am. I am Yahweh. That is the ultimate answer. And he is the ultimate authority over governments, over political parties, over pastors and, 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 and shepherds, over parents, over bosses and supervisors, kings and princes. He is to be the ultimate authority. As we finish up this morning, I want you to notice that the answer which Moses received from Almighty God was an immutable, that word immutable means unchangeable authority for the greatest of missions. God was not asking Moses, hey, come along, i got stuff for you to do. God was not suggesting to Moses that he'd go and be the deliverer. God was telling him. The older I get, the more I realize that calling of God is not actually a calling, it's a command that we are not to ignore. He says the name, or excuse me, the answer which Moses received from Almighty God was an immutable, unchangeable authority for the greatest of missions to go and deliver God's people. That's been God's mission ever since the Garden of Eden when He promised that He would send the seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. And it's been going on ever since. God is deliverer, the people needing to be delivered. That's why Jesus came to deliver us. So only let us be sure that we are following that authority as well. And that mission is still the same. Jesus Christ exemplified that on the cross. Moses in his, in his role as deliverer was simply a type or a foreshadow of Jesus who would do it. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus Himself says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by Me. As a matter of fact, the name Jesus, in, it, 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 actually if you were translated from the Greek in the New Testament, it would be Yeshua or Iosis. Ye and it literally means God, Yahweh, as part of that name, our salvation. Yahweh Yasha in Hebrew. Hebrew, I mean, if you were to translate it better in English, Jesus' name would actually be Joshua. And the name Yasha is salvation. Yahweh, Yasha, God our salvation. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the ultimate fulfillment of that delivery mission. And then it goes on to say in Acts, once the church was established, and this is our call, it says here, Peter preaching the first sermon, he's talking about salvation, and he says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other. Not Allah, not Buddha, not Vashni, not Krishna, but Yahweh God and His Son, Yeshua, Jesus. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. To be saved, you must go through Jesus. Because He said, no one comes to the Father but by Me. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Peter said, there is no salvation in any other. For there is no other name given among heaven whereby we must be saved. So the name Jesus linked with the name Yahweh and it is God's holy, righteous, special name. And just like you would not want your mother's name, your father's name, or even your name defiled, defamed, used as a curse word, do you think God does? It is because His name, there is salvation in His name. There is power in His name. As a matter of fact, Paul said in Philippians that the name of Jesus one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. And so no, we should not take the name of the Lord our God in vain. We should not treat it like a byword, a curse word, a throwaway. And I leave you with this again, Proverbs 18.10. We should run to the name of the, of the Lord. For Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord, and that word Lord is in all capitals, it's Yahweh, 
the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. So this morning I ask you, do you know God? Have you spent time getting to know God? In your bulletin this morning, there are lists of different characters of God, character aspects of God's nature. Some of the names there. Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that provides. You read those. Elohim. El Shaddai, God our shield. Go through those names this week. Get your Bibles out and go through them and learn about this amazing God you say that you love and worship. Run to Him. Run to His name. And you will find security and safety. 